Continuing with chapter 38, uh, assessment-based approach to the pediatric patient. Like everything else, we want to make sure that we take our uh, s scene size up, uh, look for any potential problems. Uh, of course, the whole aspect of when we're dealing with uh, the uh, child, um, this might be uh, needing additional resources quickly, um, which could also include law enforcement um, and or uh, additional EMS providers. Um, if you do have a safe scene, of course, uh, standard precautions, BSI, um, and all that. Um, in dealing with uh, some of the uh, pediatric traumas, um, if there's only one uh, patient, um, you might, or again, you might need more than uh, additional resources depending on the, the type of scenario. Like everything else, um, from the primary assessment, um, the airway, breathing, circulation, uh, but what we actually talk about uh, more uh, is the pediatric assessment triangle. Um, and this will give you a, a priority scheme of either sick or not sick. Uh, and what the, the PAT, again, it's an ABC type algorithm, uh, but it looks more at the uh, appearance of the child uh, and then looking at the breathing and the circulation. Um, so if, from the perspective of the level of consciousness, um, either using your Glasgow coma scale or more of the av poo uh, so the alert the verbal uh, the painful or the completely unresponsive assessing the airway checking the breathing uh, and then dealing with the circulation uh, either looking at capillary refills um, or the actual pulse so the pediatric assessment triangle, uh, as you can see, this is a very happy child, uh, so well appearing. Um, so on the PAT, which is the from the American Pediatric um, Academy, um, the appearance is very much like the consciousness. How do they interact? Are they talking? Are they babbling? Are they just a floppy looking kid? Uh, worker breathing is the breathing. Um, are they fast, labored, shallow? Um, and all that stuff, counting the number of respira respirations. Again, remembering you know, until the age of five um, that they are two to three times that of a normal adult, and a normal adult typically is 10 to 14 per minute. And then what does the skin color look like? So if you open the door, are they blue? Are they ashen gray? Um, are they pink? Um, and all that. Their appearance, um, from the aspect of their tone, um, are they a floppy? Um, do they have good tone in the arms and legs? Are they moving everything? Um, are they interactive t with you? Um, do they smile, wave, um, or are they shy? Um, are they irritable, kicking and screaming? Um, are they consolable? Uh, so if you um, were to have the child um, and give the child to the parents, and traditionally the parents or the guardian um, can console on the child. Um, from there, uh, looking at the uh, their look or their gaze, are they looking around? Are they seeing things? Um, and then they're, are they talking or crying? Um, as you can see, um, this little uh, mnemonic here, the T-I-C-L-S or the tickles, um, will give you some of that uh, additional information. Worker breathing, um, do you hear abnormal sounds? Are they posturing, leaning forward? Um, if you were to look at their um, skin, um, if you were to able to lift up their shirt and all that stuff, um, they, are they actually retracting, meaning the skin, um, either at the supraclavicular, so above the collarbones, or in between the ribs, um, the, um, are they, is it actually being sucked in, pulled in, um, just because they're trying to breathe so hard. Um, if you look at their, na their nose, um, like a, uh, a bulldog and all that stuff, how they get their, um, when they're breathing really hard, um, their nose, the nasal airway can actually um, open up just because they're trying to take a lot more airway in uh, and then from there um, a telltale late sign of course um, are they having head bobbing um, which is a, an indication of uh, exhaustion and potential respiratory failure circulation um, are they pale 
Um, sometimes with this, you might not see it in the skin, uh, specifically some of um, our um, dark colored uh, pigmented counterparts, so blacks, um, even Asians, you might not always see um, their, the paler. Uh, so looking at their mucosa, um, either in the eyes, if you pull down their eyelids or lift, have them lift up their tongue um, and see if it's pale. Um, are they modeling? Um, do they have that spider web looking color um, on their um, chest and all that stuff? Are they blue? Um, do they have the petechiae, which are the, all those uh, red spots, um, which are a telltale sign um, that you're having um, a uh, vascular collapse? So actually blood is leaking um, from the vascular system um, and it's you're staining under the skin. Uh, and a whole bunch of petechiae together is the purpura. Um, and usually when you start seeing purpura, um, that is a potential bad sign. So again, from the perspective of the, the PAT, the Pediatric Assessment Triangle, um, it's the a well versus sick child. Uh, so asking yourself, you know, are they displaying normal behavior for their age? Okay, If they are nine months old and they can't sit up, um, then there's a problem. Um, if they're, you know, a two-month-old um, and there's an obvious deformity, well, we know that two months old, they don't walk, so they shouldn't have a deformity of a leg or an arm. Um, so taking into consideration of, you know, non-accidental trauma. Um, do they move spontaneously? Do they seem lethargic? Um, do they appear attentive, looking around? Um, are they um, really uh, shy going for their parents and staying with the parents? Um, other things to take into consideration, um, are they maintaining eye contact? So our uh, preschoolers, um, they will look and see what you're doing the whole way. Um, even to um, our, um, our um, the school age children um, and even adolescents, um, are they consolable uh, with their parents? Um, and do they respond when the parents uh, or, or caregivers um, actually call them? Formal impressions, um, these are anything that's uh, conditions uh, presenting with an abnormal uh, PAT. Um, so looking at respiratory distress, respiratory failure, um, the whole aspect of compensated shock versus uncompensated or decompensated shock, uh, poor brain perfusion uh, or um, traumatic brain injuries, uh, and then ultimately the, the aspect of the cardiopulmonary failure. Uh, we do know that from the perspective of a, uh, a crying baby um, is actually a lot of times a, a good sign because um, we know that they are a breathing um, child. Um, so that's a potential um, from the aspect of looking at or how the cry, um, if it's just a little muffling, you know, uh, whimpering cry, um, that's, of course, a very concern. Um, other things for sick babies to, to take in consideration, um, if they're limp and flaccid, um, if they have, again, that weak or absent cry, if they're not reacting or interacting with the environment, if they're not grabbing things, if you put your finger um, in their hand, they'll grab um, your um, finger. It's called the uh, pincher reflex. Um, and then from there, um, other reflexes is if you touch their face, um, the Monroe, so they'll actually will look over because um, they're trying to, from the perspective of um, thinking about feeding and all that stuff. Other, um, when we start getting into the pediatric advanced life support, um, our consciousness, the breathing, and the color. Uh, so, you know, from the aspect of what is the level of consciousness, um, the AVPU, are they alert? Um, do they respond to only verbal? 
Um, do they respond to painful stimuli um, or are they uh, unresponsive? Uh, with the breathing, uh, what is their work of breathing? Um, are they breathing fast, breathing slow, not breathing at all? Is it decreased? Um, are they having accessory muscle use, abnormal breathing patterns, um, like your chine stroke breathing, too small breathing? Uh, they, uh, kids can still have all that stuff. Uh, so it's signs of traumatic brain injury or diabetes. <laughs> And then with the color, uh, looking at um, are they, is their skin, is it cyanotic, pale, flushed, um, and model. So ultimately what we're trying to do is looking at, you know, things that we have to identify early on um, so um, that we can uh, act on um, these life threats. Um, it's usually during the general impression side. Uh, breathing is adequate, of course. Just go to the primary uh, assessment, your ABCs, uh, and then go from there. If they're unresponsive, gasping breathing, um, positive pressure ventilation, um, at least 12 to 20. Um, and then from there, uh, some of these kids, though, remember, 30 to 60 is normal. Okay, so for a neonate uh, first couple months of life, they're going to need 30 to 40 breaths per minute. And then looking at or assessing for the pulse. No pulse uh, will begin chest compressions. And then depending on if it's a neonate or infant, um, traditionally we will do the thumb circling our, um, uh, process or use the two fingers. Um, if it is a... Uh, getting into our preschool or school age children, uh, traditionally getting into the one-handed method. Uh, poor perfusion, signs of, uh, from the aspect of they're not uh, maintaining well, um, heart rate less than 60s, uh, specifically in the neonate and again in the first year, um, those kids, um, they can't um, survive because their heart rate is supposed to be to uh, 100, 120, 140, so they need that fast heart rate to be able to compensate properly if the heart rate is less or is greater than 60 of course continuing on with the primary assessment level consciousness that we talked about the av poo um, it is the alert the child's interactive they're curious they're looking around they're seeing what's going on or are they just uh, respond to verbal okay you they hear a sound they'll turn their head um, or they'll open their eyes when they hear a sound um, do they respond only to painful stimuli um, the, the kid cry, cries and moans or they completely unresponsive, um, no spines of activity, uh, no nothing else. Airway assessment, uh, typically, um, of course, you'll do your little bit of um, shaking just to see if they're awake or not awake. You don't want to slam them up and down. Uh, and then uh, assessing for um, the whole process of their airway, okay? The head tilt, tin lift, um, and then um, to see if they are actually breathing. Um, as you can see here in the picture, uh, the EMS provider um, does have his ear close to the patient's lips. Um, that way he can actually feel um, the breath that's on his um, ears or face. Um, he can listen to see if there's any breathing. Uh, and then he's actually watching to see uh, the patient's uh, chest rise and fall. Of course, you want to make sure that you're taking uh, proper counting uh, measures and all that stuff. We do know that the primary uh, piece of the airway assessment um, is really to look and see because the number one cause, um, again, for cardiac arrest is a respiratory problem. Um, this can be from obstructed airway, hypoxia, um, and all that stuff. Again, the whole purpose of ensuring that we do a good head tilt chin lift, as long as there's no obvious signs of trauma, is we're trying to ensure that um, the airway is open. Um, just thinking about that whole anatomy and physiology um, that we talked about uh, in the last uh, video. Um, and if you're unsure, go back and rewatch that video. Count respirations um, from the perspective of it should be 30 to 60. Um, looking for um, airway volumes and then titles and all that stuff. 
So rapid breathing, um, again, the whole aspect of what's normal, 25 to 30. Uh, for an infant, 15 to 30 for a child, um, and then your 30 to 60 for the neonates, okay? Looking at, for any signs of hypoxia or respiratory distress, um, of course, from the aspect of the hypoxia, um, do you see the cyanosis? Are their lips blue? Do they, looking at their cap refills, do they have, you know, delayed cap refill, um, you know, more than um, two seconds? Seconds. Um, are they tachypnic? Are they having um, flaring of their nostrils? Are they retracting? Okay. Um, so are all potential um, uh, indications or problems for uh, respiratory problems. Uh, other things to take into consideration as possible causes of rapid breathing um, with the exclusion of the hypoxia, head injuries, lung infections, pneumonias, um, fevers um, will cause an increase in the metadoctum demand. So they need to get more oxygen into that area. Uh, diabetes with too small breathing, having high sugars, they're trying to get to uh, process uh, off. Um, aspirin uh, is always a huge or any of the other potential um, metabolic ingestions, uh, but aspirin is a huge culprit um, that these kids, um, they're breathing 60 to 70 times a minute. Stress, fear, pain, and then, you know, always the concern for shock. Uh, other things that we want to look for, um, an auscultate, noisy breathing. Are they coughing, they're gagging? Um, are they actually having any crackles? Uh, which is that if you were to take your hair and rub your hair together, um, it's almost, almost like the snap, pop, or snap, snap crackle and pop um, versus rock eye which is that watery sound um, usually more with pneumonias um, upper airway strider uh, versus lower airway wheezing uh, is the lung sounds diminished um, <coughs> and then from there you know we want to assess the circulatory system okay pulse Neonates, um, one of the first primary places that you can go to is actually feel the umbilicus. Um, from there, as they get a little bit older, um, your infants um, and school age chids um, going into the brachial artery, uh, and then uh, ultimately, or the femoral artery, um, and then our older kids, we can go to radial pulses um, and then uh, carotid uh, pulses. Um, if you can't palpate the pulse, um, always consider auscultating um, the heart uh, with a stethoscope. Um, if you do have a paramedic counterpart, um, having them throw a monitor on the kid um, will help, uh, especially in the neonates, um, to see or to see how um, their rhythm are, flat lines and all that stuff. Uh, blood pressure, um, always take into consideration. Uh, again, um, after the first you know, year of life, um, 70 plus two times their age um, will give you an ideal blood pressure. Um, if they are um, urinating or asking um, from the perspective of the parents, you know, how many wet diapers. Um, kids on average um, should have at least four wet diapers a day. Um, and those are good signs that they're um, uh, perfusing their kidneys, which means they, that they have proper or quote-unquote adequate blood supply or fluid status. Decrease in mental status uh, is also a telltale sign for a hyperperfusion. We want to look at the pulse rate and the strength. Is it weak? Is it thready? Um, is it rapid? Is it f uh, slow? Um, are what do their hands and feet, uh, the colors and the warmth? Again, from the aspect of the urinary output and the mental status. Uh, for these, uh, typically for the uh, infants, checking the brachial uh, pulse uh, under the arm. Um, is the ideal uh, location. Uh, you can also uh, look uh, into the femoral artery. Um, so taking the diaper off or pulling it down and checking the femoral repulse um, is another ideal. Um, and for this, what you want to do is from the iliac crest um, down to the pubic symphysis. Um, and then you're making, that's where you make your little uh, imaginary line um, where you see the uh, gloved hand. Um, and then from there, um, typically two fingers below um, is where you'll find uh, the uh, femoral artery. 
children and older, uh, of course, uh, you can always do the radial pulse. Uh, that's the radial aspect is on the thumb side, um, and it's going to be on the volar surface or the palm side. Um, so the thumb and palm side um, is where you'll find the radial. Um, as we get older, of course, uh, consider uh, central pulse with a carotid, uh, and then from there, <clears throat> um, uh, also, you know, the aspect of, of doing femoral. For a capillary refill, um, you can, or, you know, again, just looking at the actual capillary or squeezing um, the back of the hand or the patient's foot um, and see how quickly um, you have the return of color um, so that it should blanch down um, and then or turn that nice white color uh, in the picture. And then within two seconds, um, you should have uh, color return. Um, if this is delayed, then that's all potential concern for um, uh, decreased perfusion, um, hypovolemia. Prior to terminations, uh, again, the PAT, the PALS, uh, it's actually, we're trying to uh, prioritize things. So respiratory distress uh, with failure, then ultimately lead to respiratory arrest, um, and then uh, poor perfusion. Okay? If we see any of these uh, type characteristics based upon the PAT, then we want to act upon it immediately uh, before we getting into our secondary assessment. With the secondary assessment, um, specifically for the trauma or medical, um, we want to have um, our ample history. Uh, then from there, obtaining baseline vital signs. Okay, so nothing in the primary assessment did we actually talk about vital signs. Yes, we did a little bit with the respiratory, um, felt the pulse, and go from there. Uh, but we didn't really get much more than the pulse ox and all that stuff. Uh, from the aspect of the other. Um, with the secondary assessment, uh, making sure that we're doing a good, thorough um, head-to-toe examination. Uh, we can always, uh, you know, obtain uh, pain um, based upon the OPQRS uh, T uh, mnemonic, um, depending on the developmental age of the patient. Any uh, information um, from the ample history um, that is obtained from um, the pediatric patients, I've always you know, confirmed that uh, with um, the adult uh, caregiver, um, potential bystanders, uh, and all that stuff. So from the aspect of some things to think about uh, tips-wise um, when examining the child, okay, if possible, only one EMT deal with the child. Um, this uh, has, if you get too many people circling around the child, um, they will become uh, a little bit more defensive um, and uh, they won't talk. Uh, get down to the child's uh, eye level, okay? Again, we talked about that earlier, um, that they feel that you're a threat. Um, so sitting down, um, and smiling um, is always a huge thing. Um, school age kids, you know, start the assessment with your hands um, and then um, save the stethoscope. Okay, blood pressure cuffs, all that stuff um, to a later point. Okay, let the kid hold the stethoscope, let them play with the blood pressure cuffs. Okay, if you have to give them your pen light, um, let them have all that stuff to see beforehand um, so they know what's going on. Um, if it hurts, that should be the last thing that you actually deal with. Speaking calm, quiet voice, maintain eye contact as much as possible. Um, even with the infants, um, having that soothing voice, cool, you know, calming, cooing, and all that stuff. Okay. Try to avoid losing your temperature um, or losing your temper. Um, the kids will uh, actually pick on that. And depending on what's the situation, um, if this is a, poten a potential like domestic violence um, and the kid has been in that for a number of years, um, they can actually um, shut down and not talk to you. If you have to, step out, let your partner take over. Um, avoiding yes, no questions. Uh, so really, um, from the perspective of open-ended questions, um, just trying to get them to answer um, what they uh, should be doing. Um, from a lot of times, 
um, actually asking, you know, is it okay to take off the shirt? You know, would you like your mother to take off your shirt for you or may I help you? Um, those are things to, again, gives the kids a little bit more uh, autonomy and control. Avoid the caregivers as much as possible, specifically if they're in the back of the truck. Um, have them there um, to assist because um, you don't want to separate um, the child from the caregiver um, just from the aspect of um, keeping the child calm, um, especially when we talk about things like, like epiglottitis where we want to keep them as calm as possible. Be honest. Um, let them know if something's going to hurt. Um, if you feel like crying, it's okay. Um, they can uh, tolerate some pain, uh, but you have to let them know what's going on beforehand. Uh, ask the child for their help. Um, ask them you know, where is you know their if their belly hurts. Let them point. Um, have you know a potential uh, bears in the back of the truck, which is a, a very common thing. Um, let them bring some other toys with them. Um, their stuffed animals or their memes or whatever it is. Uh, and then be gentle, okay? Um, ultimately, we want to uh, ensure the, um, the, the best safety uh, for them at the same time, ensuring their safety and all that stuff. Special so considerations for for exam, um, of course, the, the pediatric Glasgow coma scale um, is always a little bit different, um, just because we can't um, always obtain um, some of the information. Um, lung sounds, they can always have um, a referred airway um, problems, um, so things that we think of. Um, as what is a normal um, lung sound um, can actually be a problem, or if we think of something that is a problem, um, it's just a something that's coming from the nose and all that stuff. Um, and then ideally, um, pulse oximetry, anything over 9 to 4%, you're actually fairly good. Um, but anything less than that, um, take into consideration that they're at, uh, again, increased risk for shock, um, hyperthermia, and all that stuff. Um, so the uh, low... Um, temperatures in shock states um, can cause them to have um, low pulse ox readings. Blood pressures, uh, neonates, again, anything less than 60 is hypotensive, less than 70 for the infant, um, one to two years of uh, life, uh, of age, um, again, it's the 70, uh, plus the uh, two times their, their age um, is the lower limit. Um, and then in children over 10, um, their systolic blood pressure uh, should be uh, no less than 90. Assessing uh, respirations, uh, pulse, skin, pupils, uh, blood pressures, um, all this stuff is important, okay? Remember that these are vital signs, okay? Once again, they're vital signs. We should always obtain these things, okay? Respirations, pulse, skin color, looking at their pupils, okay, plus or minus from that perspective, um, and blood pressure. It'll give us a lot of of pieces that we have to deal with. Such considerations for the history taking, okay, watch the child's interaction with the caregiver. Okay, are they shying away? Are they moving forward? Okay, are they actually interacting? Are they trying to grab for mommy and daddy? Okay, if there's an individual there that says that they're the caregiver, but the child is pushing away, like I have no clue who this individual is, is this potential abduction? Okay, so from that aspect, um, are there any life threats? Okay, take the time to establish um, their trust. Okay, if there are life threats, of course, take care of the life threat first and go from there. Calm voice, include the child, talk to the child. Okay, even when mom and dad or the caregivers are talking to you, okay, look at the child, see how the child is actually uh, interacting with you. Avoid rapid fire questions. Okay. Don't ask, you know, from the, you know, 3,000 things at one time, okay? Avoid the yes-no type questions. Um, avoid anything that increases the child anxiety, i.e., you know, pulling the child away from mom and dad, getting up really close. If you have to take the history, stay back a little bit beforehand, okay? Give the child a little bit of room uh, beforehand, 
Okay, have a systematic way of you how you do things. Okay, um, examine uh, small children, of course, um, from head to toe, or so from toe, from toe to head. Okay, um, and again, it gives them a sense of understanding. Um, sitting down, looking at the child, and all that stuff. Do not explain things too far in advance, okay? If you're going to check the child's blood sugar, uh, and then you're going to ask a whole bunch of questions, all that stuff, and then go and poke the kid, that's not a good thing, okay? Uh, from there, so let them kind of sort of explain what it is, deal with it, um, let the child play with the equipment if you can, um, so that they have an understanding of what it is. Reassess, 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 okay? M monitor, mental status, airway, breathing, circulation, all the typical ABC type things. Um, look for any compensatory mechanisms that fail or could be failing. Um, so if a kid, if their heart rate is in the 170s and 180s, and then it's slowly going up to 200, 210, that's all potential problems, okay? These kids will fall hard very quickly, okay? Any, any child that has a, a potential problem that you see on the PAT, um, you should be reassessing vital signs every three to five minutes. Okay, Assess and re record um, all everything before and after you do any interventions.